Well, we continue our study today, <clears throat> this morning, of the beauties of Jesus Christ. We've been looking several weeks at Jesus Christ as our, <clears throat> excuse me, as our example. Really, this could be an endless study as we look at, at the example of Christ, but what spurred this as we're looking at the beauties of Christ is the fact that Jesus Christ became man. He is fully God and fully man. And one of the reasons he has done that is to set for us an example of how we are to live this life. Last week we studied some snapshots from Christ's life on how he related to unbelievers. How did Jesus Christ share this glorious gospel with unbelievers? Well, today I want us to take our attention to look at Christ's example of relating to believers, relating to those in the faith. Jesus Christ is altogether lovely. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He is the beginning and the end, the life from which all life comes, the beauty from which all beauty is derived. He is tender, compassionate, warm, gracious, gentle, and kind. He is tough, resolute, resilient, persistent, and firm. In Jesus Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He is the one upon whom we gaze as we are transformed from one degree of glory into another. It is his beauty which we long to look upon in the temple of God. And therefore, it is he to whom we look as our supreme example, as our supreme imitation in this life. Octavius Winslow writes of Jesus Christ these words, With what pen, dipped though it were in heaven's brightest hues, can we portray the image of Jesus? The perfection of our Lord was the perfection of holiness. His deity, essential holiness. His humanity, without sin, the impersonation of holiness. All that he was, said, and did was as flashes of holiness emanating from the fountain of essential purity and kindling their dazzling and undying radiance around each step he trod. How humble, too, his character. How holy the thoughts he breathed. How pure the words he spoke. How gentle the spirit he exemplified. How tender and sympathizing the outgoings of his compassion and love to man. He is the chief among 10,000, the altogether lovely one. Glorious words of Christ. The chief among 10,000, the altogether lovely one. And it is my desire and aim this morning to put in front of you on a platter a glimpse from the life of Christ and his example of how he related to brethren in the faith. I want us to look at his relationships with the saved. Jesus Christ is beauty. If there is anything to behold that's beautiful in this world, it is found in Jesus Christ. So let us look. Let us look into these snapshots of his life and how he related to the brethren. We will consider today four things. We will look first at Christ's example of serving the brethren. On your bulletin, you have these outlines in the back. I am making a slight change to point number two. Instead of Christ's example of exhorting brethren in sin, I've changed that to Christ's example of restoring brethren in sin. Thirdly, we will look at Christ's example of praying for the brethren. And fourthly, we will look at Christ's example of restoring the perspective of the brethren. So first, let us consider Christ's example of serving the brethren. <clears throat> the night before he was betrayed and crucified, Jesus demonstrated something profound and shocking in his 
actions toward his disciples. He demonstrated what it means to serve the brethren. We have this recorded in John 13. Turn with me to John 13. And we see this shocking action of Jesus Christ. He washed his disciples' feet. However, before we read this account, I want to make note that this was more than just giving a snapshot of humble service. This was more than just having a glimpse of what it means to humbly serve somebody and Jesus just happened to wash their feet to show this is what humility looks like. Yes, that was an example of humility. It was an example of service, but it was more. What we're going to see in Jesus washing the, the feet of the disciples was that this, his actions was a climactic and vivid illustration of his entire ministry. He was, by getting down and washing the feet of his disciples, displaying what is the very heartbeat, what is the very core of his entire ministry on earth. He's displaying the bedrock of its foundation as he washes his disciples' feet. So let's examine this illustration, or you could perhaps say, let's examine this lived out parable of Jesus Christ in his actions toward his disciples. So if you're with me in John chapter 13, we will begin in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now pause there. The driving motivation of his ministry is love. Love for the Father, which displays itself in love for the brethren. Verse 2, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Now Paul's. Jesus Christ is showing us something much bigger than just this instance of serving in a way. It says he rose from supper. There was a time when Jesus Christ had arisen earlier. When he had arisen from his rightful place at the feast of all pleasure and joy in heaven, Christ stood up and descended to earth. This is a picture of Jesus rising for action. And what we will see his action is, is reminiscent of him rising from his rightful place at the delicious feast of glory in heaven to come down to earth to serve. Verse 4, he rose from something. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. We read the very familiar words of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Jesus Christ had a time before, here he removed his outer garments, but there was a time when Jesus Christ removed the celestial garments that he wore in heaven to come down and take upon himself the form of a servant. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. He became a true man, in order that man might look upon God and not be blinded by his glory. You know what Jesus Christ did in clothing himself with humanity? No man looks at God and lives. But he removed the glorious robes of his deity in heaven to come and take the form of man, still fully God, but now he's taken on the form of a servant so that man could actually behold God and live. He removed his garments. 
and he took a towel, a towel of service, and he tied it around his waist. Look there in verse 5. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. It would only be a matter of hours after Jesus had washed his disciples' feet with water that he would wash his disciples' souls with his very blood. That he would pour out not water from a basin, but he would pour out the blood, the lifeblood of his body on the cross to wash the souls of sinners. Then look down to verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? His washing of his disciples' feet was complete. He then puts on his robes again and returns to his place. We read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 that after making purifications for sins, Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you see this parable? His work completed. Here Jesus Christ arose from supper. As he arose from heaven, he removed his outer garments as he removed the, the celestial garments which he wore and he comes down and he puts on a servant's robe, a servant's towel and he gets down low and begins to wash his disciples' feet with water as he poured out his blood to wash the souls of sinners. Amen. But after completing it, after the washing is done, what does Christ do? He puts back on his garments and he sits back down as he ascended to heaven, put back on his robes of, right, of, of glory in heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father, his Amen. work complete. Amen. Do you see it? It's a parable of the entire ministry of God. It's not just some simple action of, hey, this is what it looks like to be humble and serve. Christ is showing us the very heartbeat of his ministry. He continues in verse 13 of John 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done. What a glorious image of what it meant for Jesus Christ to wash our feet. This was not some piddly example of a humble act. This was the very core of what Jesus Christ, it was a very demonstration of the gospel which Jesus Christ came into this world to perform. What Jesus Christ is showing us is the very hope of nations. This world is in darkness. And God came in human flesh to serve and to lay his life as a ransom. You realize apart from the servanthood of Christ, there is no hope for this world. Apart from Jesus Christ putting on the robes of a servant and getting prostrating himself to wash the feet of sinners, there is no hope in this world. Do you see the magnitude of what he's showing us? This is not just saying, hey, serve each other and do this or do that. He's showing us the very essence of the entire gospel message which he came to perform. And in verse 15, if you notice, he says, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Christian, we are given an example of Jesus Christ in his service toward us in order that we might imitate him in serving the brethren. You know, this is not the world's mindset. The world craves and craves its own desires. It craves to be served. We live, especially in this Western culture, in a very you-serve-me culture. 
I deserve, I deserve, give me, give me, give me. And this is what we're told in Mark 10, 45. You don't have to turn there, but listen to Mark 10, beginning in verse 42. Jesus says this, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. This is the world we live in. Those in power, what do they do? They lord it over the weaker ones. Those who are in power take advantage of the weaker ones. We see it everywhere, don't we? We see it from the workplace, through, through the boss who's on a power trip, to the world dictators across this globe. Men who are in power use it to manipulate or to gain their own advantage from those they're in power over. And that's what Christ says. The rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Now listen to verse 43 of Mark 10. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Why? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christian, you are to be different. Christian, you are to be like your Savior. The natural fallen disposition of the human heart is to crave to be served. It's to lord one another, our authority over one another, and to demand service from one another. But Christ has shown us another way. Christ has shown us a better way, that of a life of service. And what is the result? of this countercultural life which Christ is calling us to. What's the result? Well, we know Christ was exalted at the right hand of the Father. And for you and me, the result of a servanthood life, look there in verse 13 of John, or 17 of John 13. <clears throat> if you know these things, blessed are you, if you do them. This is the blessing of dwelling with Christ in glory for all eternity in perfect communion and fellowship with Him. What's the result of following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ as servant? It's to dwell with Jesus Christ in glory forever. Those who will be are first will be last. Those who are last will be first. Christian, the result of a countercultural life of servanthood in following the example of your Savior is a life of blessing. And what's that blessing? That ultimate blessing is of dwelling with Jesus Christ in glory, in perfect communion and fellowship with Him and with one another. I want to urge you as a congregation to think of practical ways and areas in which we can serve one another, both individually and corporately. Perhaps you know of a way where you could be serving and you've been putting it off because you really don't want to go there. Or perhaps you know of a way that somebody's been serving you and you appreciate it and you like taking it, but you really don't want to give back or lay down your life for them. I would urge you that for you to think concentratedly, to really think and say, how can I be serving those around me? It is an honor to follow our Savior's footsteps in imitating the very heartbeat of His ministry. You know, this is not something where we go, okay, Christ at one point uh, prostrated Himself and washed the feet of the disciples, so I'll do something here or there that's nice. What I'm seeking to show you in this action of Christ is that this was not just a one and done action, but this was a parable or a demonstration of his entire ministry from when he stood up in heaven, came down to earth, died and rose and was seated again. Do you see that? It should characterize our entire life as Christians in how we relate to one another. We should relate to one another as servants of one another striving to serve and lay down our lives. Think about it. If you want to display to this world a life that has been radically changed and tra transformed by the gospel, 
How are you going to do so? It's not just by saying, I have more discipline than I used to and I go to church on Sunday. I, I have a joy that I used to not have. Those are true. God gives us joy abundant. He gives us discipline and victory over sin. But one of the greatest ways that you are going to display to this world the glorious gospels of Jesus Christ is by you reflecting the very heart of Jesus' entire life and ministry as a servant. He came not to be served, but to serve. May we follow in his footsteps in this way. So I urge you, congregation, to think of practical ways and areas where you can serve one another. But secondly, let us examine Christ's example of restoring brethren who are in sin. I want us to stay here in John 13 for a moment and consider another aspect of Jesus' actions to his disciples. Look back at John 13, verse 5. We read this. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. But Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. This is a very interesting interaction between Peter and his Lord. Lord, you will not wash my feet. If, you, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. And what is Peter's response? Wash everything. Wash head, feet, hands, everything. Give it to, I want to be a part of you. You know, in Iraq, uh, when I was over in Iraq, it's, I was warned before going that in the Middle East, to, I oftentimes cross my feet when I sit. And I was told, don't cross your feet when you sit because you may point the sole of your foot at somebody, your host, or somebody around you, and it's very, very disrespectful to show somebody your foot. Why is that? Well, you think about it. You may be, have your whole body clean and have just washed up, prepared all the kids, you're going to a dinner party, and then you step outside, and certainly in the Middle East, in this time when they wore sandals, you step on the dirty road, and what gets dirty? Your feet. Your whole body may be clean, but your feet will instantly be dirty. What happens when you step out of the shower and you step onto the ground? If there's something dirty on the ground, it's now on your feet. doesn't matter. Your whole body is not contaminated, but your feet are dirty. And Peter is appalled that Jesus is actually bending down to clean his feet like the role of a servant. When you go into somebody's house and this time, the servant comes and washes the feet. And he says, Lord, Messiah, the, the Messiah, the one sent from God who we are, you're going to wash my feet like a servant? And Jesus says to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now what I want us to see from this is that this washing of the feet is a picture of Jesus Christ cleansing the Christian from sin. Now that's important because we know that it is the cleansing of the Christian from the defilement of sin because of what Jesus says next. Peter says to him in verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So here's G him saying, well, then wash everything. But Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. See what he said? The disciples are clean, except for Judas. Jesus knows Judas will betray. Judas, was, Judas did not come and gain salvation and then lose it. Jesus says he's not clean. He's never been washed. You are washed, and yet they need cleansing of their feet, but not their whole body. Why? Because Jesus says you're already completely clean. What is he saying? What's this a symbol of? Jesus is telling Peter that he does not need to be perpetually born again over 
and over. Oh, you sinned, Christian? You've lost your salvation. You've got to come and be a new creation. You've got to be justified again. Jesus is saying no. Jesus is displaying the reality that as Christians who have been made clean by the washing of the Holy Spirit in regeneration, we must continue to perpetually go to Christ, cleansing from the remaining defilements of sin. The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. As Christians who've been washed by the blood of Christ, who've been regenerated and have a new spirit, we continue to walk on this earth. We continue to remain with remaining defilements of sin. We're not yet fully redeemed in heaven. Our consummate glory is yet to come. We still remain in this flesh with worldly entanglements, worldly temptations, and defilements. And so what is Christ telling us? We are to perpetually run to Christ for cleansing of sin that remains. He's not saying you've got to be washed entirely, re-justified, but Christ continues to cleanse us from remaining sin. And how is this an example for you and me today? We look to Jesus and how he related to the Christian who was defiled by sin to determine how we are to relate to such a brother. How do we relate to somebody who's in sin, struggling, battling against sin, or blinded to sin and walking in sin ignorantly? We are to humbly and gently restore such a brother or sister by washing them with the Word of God. We are to come to them and to gently take God's Word and apply it to their lives in the area of their sin in an effort to cleanse them from that sin. As Christ came to His disciples to their feet and cleansed them from the remaining defilements, we are to go to our brothers and sisters who are in sin with the Word of God and gently seek to wash them with that Word to cleanse them from the sin. We're told this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We read, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." Do you see it? As Christ went to his disciples and washed their feet, we too are to go to our brothers and sisters following his example to seek to cleanse them from the defilements of sin. We're to bear one another's bur burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Think again of Jesus. <clears throat> Think how often Jesus Christ with his disciples had to exhort, rebuke, and admonish them. As we read through the Gospels, what do we read? He's listening to his disciples and they're arguing again. Who's going to be the greatest? And he has to go to them and rebuke them. Somebody comes to him saying, your disciples couldn't cast out this demon. And he has to say, oh, you of little faith to his disciples. Over and over, you of little faith, slow to believe. Rebuking them. What did he say to Peter? When Peter actually has the audacity to rebuke Jesus for saying he had to go to the cross. And what does he say to Peter? Get behind me. Satan. Peter strikes Malchus's ear and Jesus rebukes him. Enough of this. Over and over as we read the Gospels, we see Jesus perpetually having to rebuke and admonish his disciples in sin. Could you not watch with me this hour before Jesus is going to be crucified and the disciples are falling asleep? They couldn't endure one hour and Jesus rebukes them over and over. After all of the falling asleep instead of praying, arguing about who's the greatest, disbelief, constant questioning, and what does Jesus say about his disciples to his Father? We need to learn from this. Jesus has just walked with these disciples, rebuking them over and over for all their failures, their shortcomings. And listen to what Jesus Christ says of these very same disciples as he prays to his Father in John 17, verse 6. Listen to this. 
I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. He's talking about his disciples. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. We are called, like Christ, to exhort, to rebuke, to admonish one another out of a heart of pure love and concern. And you say, well, how will I know my motivation for correcting them was the same as Christ's motivation for correcting his disciples? If you too, like Jesus, look upon your brothers and sisters in the Lord and can look to God and say, Father, they have kept your word. Looking upon the Christians as those who are following Christ, not looking upon them, nitpicking their faults and failures and portraying that as who they are, but coming to them lovingly and gently, correcting and rebuking and admonishing when need be, but then seeing them as Christ sees them. Those, though all their failures and weaknesses, those who are following Christ. My father often says it as we relate to believers that we are to look for signs of grace amongst in people's lives, not for failures and shortcomings, not trying to nitpick and find their faults. We need to search for signs of Christ-likeness in our brothers and sisters, not nitpicking their sins. There will be ample time for, where you must lovingly admonish and exhort. And we're told in Galatians 6, it may very well save the soul and the life of your brother, but we are to do so lovingly as Christ did. You know, Christ did not see opportunities to rebuke his disciples as an opportunity to say, aha, I got you. I knew I was more righteous than you. I knew I was more farther along in my journey of holiness than you. No, he saw opportunities to re rebuke and exhort his disciples as an opportunity to draw them closer to God, to show them their sin that they might repent and be drawn closer to the Lord. And for you and I, as we look at our brothers and sisters around us, do you feel that the sins of your brothers and sisters are burdens to your own soul? Or is it a gleeful opportunity to show them their failure? Did you, did you see that? Do you see the faults and failures of your brothers and sisters around you as a burden to your very soul? And you have a desire to restore them that they might excel in their walk with Christ? Or do you see it as an opportunity to put yourself above them? Ah, I can go rebuke them again for the same thing. And I can again show myself how I am more mature than they are. Jesus Christ looked at his disciples' sin and it broke his heart. He longed for them to be pure and righteous as he is pure and righteous. That's why he prays, Lord, sanctify them in your truth, Father. Your word is truth. But once they were restored, how did he look at them? He rejoiced over them and he forgot their sin. Don't you see that? Over and over he had to rebuke them. And once they were restored, he turns to his father and says, they've kept your word. He forgets their sin. Do we have a holy forgetfulness with our brothers and sisters? It ought to break our hearts to see one another in sin. And thus we ought to go to them out of a love for them to see them restored and to excel in the race of the Christian life. For that's what Jesus Christ has done as a glorious example of how we are to treat our fellow brothers and sisters in sin. Patient, loving, gentle seeking to see them restored. Well, may we treat them in this way. Thirdly, let us look at Christ's example of praying for the brethren. Turn with me briefly to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, and then we will look a little more in depth at John 17. In Luke 22, we have this interaction again with Peter, 22 verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. 
Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ prayed for Peter? Satan demanded to have Peter, to sift him like wheat. Satan wanted to destroy the belief of Peter. Satan wanted to damn Peter. Satan wanted to grip his soul with sin. And Jesus Christ intercedes and says, Peter, I've prayed for you. And you know what he says? He doesn't say, and if you rise again. He says, when? When you've turned again, restore your brothers. You will turn again. Satan's not going to have you, Peter. I've prayed for you. Jesus Christ prayed for his disciples. Turn to John 17 to see this more vividly. Now we'll see Jesus Christ praying for us. John 17, verse 9. I am praying for them. Hear Christ praying to the Father. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jump down a few verses to verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus Christ knows that temptations are coming for the believer. In fact, it's necessary that temptations come. What happened to Jesus when he began his public ministry? 40 days of fasting to be tempted by the devil. Temptation is not to be escaped in this life, and Jesus knows that. But he specifically prays for the Christian that we would not be taken out of this world and removed from any temptation. He says specifically, I don't ask that you take them out. Leave them in. Let them face temptation. But keep them from the evil one. Sanctify them. Make them holy. Christ has prayed for you and I that we would be holy. Aren't you glad as you face the daily assaults of your flesh and the world and Satan that Jesus Christ lifted this prayer to the Father? Just as he prayed for Peter, Satan demanded to have you. Satan had the audacity to go to God and demand Peter. I want him. And what does Jesus say happened? There's Satan before God. I want that one. Give him to me. And Jesus comes and says, Father, don't let Satan have him. Don't let him go. And the Father listens to Christ. And he does that for you and me. Satan demands to have you. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for your soul. But you have one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's prayed to the Father for you, if you are in Christ, that you would not be had by Satan. Aren't you glad for that? I feel overwhelmed by the temptations that hit me. I look forward to the years to come and say, God... You know, I've looked back at a man like Martin Lloyd-Jones, a man like John Murray. You know these men, Bishop Ryle, they've died, and they died well. No scandal about their life. It didn't come out they were sleeping with other women, unfaithful to their wife. It didn't come out that their ministry was a financial scam. Integrity. Godly men, they made it to the end, and they're dead in the Lord. Now they're in heaven rejoicing. They've made it. They died well. And I look at that, and I say, oh, just to die well. The Lord may give me decades to run this race. I just want to die well. I just want to make it to the end. And it can be frightening. It can bring temptations to anxiety to know all the temptations I'm going to face along the way with all the stresses of life. How am I going to make it? You know how? Jesus Christ prayed for me. Father, keep him. Don't let the evil one touch him. Aren't you glad Christ has prayed for you the same? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. And you and I are to continue following in that example. Jesus didn't just do this. 
to show you what he's done for us. He did this to give us an example of what we are to do for one another. Look at this. It's one of the weapons of our warfare given to us to battle against the spiritual forces of wickedness. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 verse 10, famous verses. Ephesians 6 verse 10, we read this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong, Christian. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Now Paul's there. This is no skirmish. Christian, this is a war. We are engaged in all-out warfare against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. Evil! How evil is evil? You look around and see this darkness, this darkness that assaults your mind. Have you ever been sitting there in prayer meeting and you get all of a sudden putrid, wicked thoughts pierce your mind and you say, where has this come from? As Satan throws his darts, as you look around at the temptations bombarding you, the temptations of pure wickedness and evil, just how dark is this darkness? You realize Satan is bound. The nations are not completely deceived. The light of Christ has gone to the ends of the earth. You know that, right? Therefore, the evil that you see around us in this nation, in the Middle East, in Asia, and as wicked as it is, the torture, the sexual molestation, the rape, the wickedness, it's a fraction of the evil displayed if Satan could have his way. Do you see that? Satan is bound and we're still this wicked as we're following his footsteps. If Satan was unleashed, could you imagine the power of evil? That's who we are against. It's a warfare. It's no small skirmish, Christian. So what are we to do? How are we not only to survive, but how are we to conquer and to rule as Jesus made so clear in Matthew 16, 18, when he says the gates of hell will not prevail? How in the world are we to conquer? We're not in a defense mode, Christian. We're not sitting here going, I just want to survive and get out of here. So we get in the fetal position, put a sh shield around us and say, okay, wake me up when it's over. No, we are the conquerors. How? Let's read how. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand firm, conqueror. Stand firm, Christian. Your knees aren't shaking. You're not buckling. You're stood firm. How? Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Christian, behold the mighty weapons of your warfare given you by God the belt of truth, the breastplate of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Christian, behold the mighty array of deadly weapons with which you are more than a conqueror. You're no victim in this fight. You're a conqueror. Satan has no power against these weapons. But then notice, look at verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication 
for all the saints. This is not an individual battle. You are on the front lines entering enemy territory. The fiery shafts barreling down upon your head. The enemy gates coming closer in view with every step. The chanting of the demonic fiends turns from a distant buzz into an ominous roar as you approach hell's gate. Are you concerned about yourself? Absolutely. Have I got my, my belt of, of uh, what's the belt of truth? The breastplate of righteousness, have I, am, I, am I guarded? You're concerned. Do I have the shield of faith? Ha, I'm, I'm concerned here about myself. You knew this moment was coming. Christ told you it was. So you've fastened on the belt of truth. You've, you've given heed to the, to the warnings. You've covered yourself in, in the weapons of God and, the, and the, the armor of God. You've concerned about yourself. But if you stood alone, this would be a massively different warfare. You are not concerned only for yourself. You are surrounded by hundreds of thousands of fellow soldiers, and they are all experiencing the same assault in war. Ask any soldier, are you alone on the field? They'll say, absolutely not. They know full well that their life might end protecting the life of their brother next to them. And Paul is telling us here, do not be so self-consumed by your battle and by your struggle that you fail to come to the aid of your fellow soldiers. Whether rookies in the fight or aged and experienced, come to their side. And you say, how? Unlike the scene I just described of the physical battle, the physical soldier going to war, this battle is not purely a physical one. It is of the spiritual realm. In a physical war, picture this, you may have to stand over a wounded brother in the fight as he regains consciousness and there you stand with your shoulder and the assaults are coming, the darts are coming and you're standing there protecting him as he regains and you're saying, come on man, get up, get up. You're trying to wake him up and restore him. In the physical war, right? We all hear of these dramatic stories. How much more so in the spiritual battle in which we're engaged, there comes a time, brothers and sisters, for you to stand over a wounded soldier and with the weapon of prayer, protect them and intercede for them and make petition for them that they would regain consciousness, that they would stand up with the strength of the Lord and not be destroyed. Do you see it? Look at the weapon that you've been given, praying at all times in the Spirit. Brethren, this is huge. You're not alone on the battlefield of the Christian life. It doesn't matter what armor you have on. If it's you against 10,000 in a physical war, you're done. Christian, you're stood next to an army of Christians. Yes, be concerned for yourself. You better make sure you've got the breastplate of imputed righteousness. If you're trying to earn your way to heaven, your chest is bare. You better put on the righteousness of Christ, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. But what Paul is telling us here is that there are soldiers next to us and we've got to fight with them and we've got to fight for them. Jesus Christ set for us an example to follow when he looked at Peter and said to him, I've prayed for you. Satan demanded to have you. I've prayed for you. He set for us an example when he prayed for us. Father, keep them in your name. Keep them from the evil one. Sanctify them in your truth. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has set for us an example of a life of prayer for one another. How often, I confess, my own prayer life can become consumed by me, myself, and I. And I can forget you. I can forget those in chains around this world. We are a small body of believers here in Laredo, but we have so many needs. Think of it. 
the emotional stresses of singleness, pressures from mom and dad, persecutions from the world, or abandonment from a spouse, the financial pains of wondering whether or not you will be able to provide food for your family, or if your business is going to survive this quarter, or if you will be able to make it on your own. We have the spiritual attacks of sexual temptation beating you down throughout the night. Temptations to doubt God's love for you, to doubt your love for Him, to wonder if all things really are working together for good. We have the physical pains of a damaged leg being unable to get enough energy to do what needs to be done, wondering if these symptoms are cancer, learning that you're not as healthy as you thought you were. Brothers and sisters, these are real concerns facing our little body of Laredo here. Are you fighting for one another? Are you praying for one another for these concerns, for the assaults of the devil and the evil one? Satan is demanding to have us. His desire is for your soul and for the soul of the one next to you. Are you praying for one another that your faith would not fail? Christ set us an example. How do we relate to the brothers? Pray for them. Remember your brothers and sisters in the fight. Well, fourthly and finally, let us consider Christ's example of restoring the perspective of the brethren. And for the sake of time, please turn to Luke 10, but for the sake of time, we won't read all of the passage. But we know in Luke chapter 10 that Jesus Christ has just sent out 72 of his disciples. He's given them authority to go into all the, the, the villages and proclaim the gospel and have power over the devils. It's interesting, as a note, and you can study this on your own, it's a privilege, Christian, Whoever rejects the Christian, Jesus Christ says they're rejecting Christ. You do realize that when you share the gospel with an unbeliever and they reject you, it's as if Jesus Christ in the flesh stood there with them, proclaimed to them the gospel, and they said, no, Jesus. That's what he says in Luke 10. But watch what happens. We'll begin in verse 17. It's a glorious moment. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Because of the tense of the Greek verb, this implies continuous action. A better translation perhaps would be, I was beholding Satan as lightning falling from heaven. It's a continuous action. As the disciples were going, Jesus Christ was watching Satan fall as they were going. But listen to what he says. I saw Satan fall, or I was beholding Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Verse 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. This is the power of Ephesians 6 we just saw. These are the dark rulers. This is no small thing. He's given us power, Christian. We're not in the fetal position waiting for it to be over. We are more than conquerors in this fight. And he's given us power. And look what he says. Over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. That the spirits are subject to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The disciples were exhilarated. Exhilarated. Could you imagine it? Lord, even the demons are so... In the name of Christ, be gone. And they go. Demons. And they're filled with joy. And they come back to Christ. Jesus. It's incredible. It's an incredible moment, really. It's a celebration of the victory of Christ over the devil and his angels. And yet watch what Jesus Christ does next. Don't rejoice in this. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus restores perspective. Look at the big picture, brethren. You're saved. You're a Christian. 
You're going to heaven. What an incredible example. Is your life great? Are you having victory over Satan and the devil? Is all well in the household? Even so, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We sang it just before, didn't we? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, that let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Isn't that it? Is life great? It's well with your soul. Is, are the billows of the sea of temptation and trial and persecution crashing down on your little boat? It is well with your soul. A restored perspective to sit back and see what Christ sees. He says, think on eternity, Christian. Keep at the forefront of your mind the grand picture of eternity. He didn't do this only in celebratory times. He did it in mournful times. You remember the disciples say, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And he says, you'll regain it in the life to come. Much more than this. In Matthew 10, he talks about suffering brutal persecution. What does he say? The final day. Look to the final day. He's restoring perspective. And we are to do the same. As Jim Elliott famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Eternity. It is ever on Christ's mind. And he is always reminding his disciples of to keep focused upon it. And believer, we are to live lives in light of eternity and for one another, consistently reminding one another of the prize, the glory of perfect communion with Christ. It's coming and it's fast approaching. Let us then remind one another when the going is difficult that brother, it's all for Christ. Sister, the glory is coming. The reward is fast approaching. Press on, dig in, don't give up. It's coming. You know, we can become so focused on the temporal, can't we? We can be so beat down by today and the trials of tomorrow and we can forget and we need one another to come along and say, brother, get your eyes on Christ. This temptation, this is light, momentary affliction. It's preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Can't you see it? The bride is coming. The feast is awaiting. Christ will come to conquer and to bring you to himself. Persevere to the end. You know, in, in preseason for soccer, one of the greatest... Uh, times when we would uh, come kind of this form this brotherhood on the team is when preseason it's steaming hot outside you're running mile after mile you're going through all these fitness tests and when that's when you come alongside your brother and say come on man one more lap come on man it's worth it think of the prize and we're running together Christian that's what we ought to do that's what Christ did with his disciples when times were good when times were bad what did Christ do Think on eternity. Get your perspective where it needs to be. It's worth it. The battle is raging, but the reward is coming. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, we press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In conclusion, then, let us look to our example, the altogether lovely one who served his loved ones, exhorted those in sin, prayed for the brethren, and restored their perspective to an eternal one. May you and I follow in his footsteps of humble servant, servanthood, gentle admonition, desperate intercession, and of loving restoration with one another. Church, we are the light of the world. May we see one another as Christ sees us. And may we say with David, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. 
Amen. Father, may you grant us the strength to follow in your footsteps in relating to the brethren. Oh God, help us that we would be like your son. It is in his name we ask. Amen. Amen.